next few weeks, thousands of 11-year-olds will be starting their new schools for the first time. But arguments over what kind of secondary school works best have never gone away. In a new series, Evan Davis now explores the surprising history of one of the most controversial education reforms of the 20th century, the introduction of the comprehensive school in COMP. This building was part of this grammar, was grammar school. That was grammar. And the, the, the hedge would have come here. Was it this place? No, it couldn't have been. It, it must wasn't have been it there. about where those bollards are? Those... Because of you getting in the canteen. No, well, it's a grey morning in Surrey. I'm at my old school with one of my English teachers, and I'm looking for any trace of an old hedge. Yeah. So I think the hedge. this this was essentially the boundary. Now let's just see if there's any sign at all of plantation or of the life. Absolutely the not. Absolutely not. No. <laughs> that the hedge is long gone. It was taken down in 1976 as part of the defining event of my school days. Why did it matter? Well, it had provided a barrier between my grammar school on one side and a secondary modern school on the other, but it was removed to create one large comprehensive. Across England and Wales, thousands of hedges were literally or metaphorically being taken down in an educational revolution. Scotland, which has its own education system, could only look across the border, bewildered at the conflict and the upheaval unleashed. The history of the comprehensive school that we'll be tracing over these four programmes encapsulates the history of post-war Britain. High hopes and grand plans, class conflict and disillusionment. Even today, some people want to bring those hedges back. The idea of mixing these two schools together was one which filled not only the teachers but also the pupils with absolute horror. I think there was a tremendous feeling that something would be lost and that nothing would be gained. A lot of my fellow teachers at Southall Grammar School couldn't understand why I had applied for a post in a comprehensive school in such an area of London. You didn't get the stigma because you didn't get to grammar school. You still had the chance to improve. The men and women of this country who have endured great hardships in the war are asking what kind of life awaits them in peace. For their children, they desire an educational system that will give them the chance to develop all their faculties. Clement Attlee led Labour to power in 1945, ready to build a new, fairer, welfare state Britain. Did the comprehensive school feature in that vision? No. Attlee's vision was that of R.A. Butler's New Education Act. This promised a free secondary education for all. At 11, each child would go to one of three types of school. The grammar for the academic child, the technical school for the vocational, and the modern school for the rest. This was the tripartite system. I'm glad you've come, because I wanted to talk to you about Christine. She's 10 now, and this term she'll be taking her 11 plus test. Yes. We've got to try and discover which kind of secondary school she should go to. That is, thinking of her abilities. To discover precisely which type of school Christine should go to, there was the 11 plus exam. An IQ test designed as a fair way to measure each child's innate intelligence. Now, this meant working class kids would have the same chance of going to a grammar school as the rich kids down the road. So, Far from criticising the 11 plus as elitist, the left in particular saw it as thoroughly meritocratic and progressive. As two beneficiaries of the grammar school system remember, Labour historian Kenneth Morgan and the future MP Chris Price. Those on the left who believed in the 11 plus grew up in an atmosphere of a brave new world which could be organised on a scientific basis and so that a lot of the early Labour Party Fabians believed in the intelligence quotient which seemed to fit in with a grammar school picking a scientifically selected group. The grammar school did seem to be Labour's answer to Eton, Labour's answer to the public schools. It was widely believed that the best state schools would in due course outdo the public schools and the public schools in due time would wither away. 
The post-war education minister responsible for making grammar schools and the tripartite system work was Ellen Wilkinson, a firebrand redhead, hero of the left, a veteran of the Jarrow Hunger March. A great deal of difference between the wages of certain workers. Ellen Wilkinson herself was a product of a northern grammar school. She clearly regarded herself as championing the able working class person. Whether he's the Duke of Bedford, should have roughly the same income. She felt that the grammar schools and the butler provision was the left-wing answer, providing a state system which would deal with all the children of the country and not a small minority, as had been the case before. The system was strikingly successful. It produced some wonderful grammar schools, and it was a ticket to success for a swathe of working-class youngsters. You might have thought that as the vision had been shared by Labour's Ellen Wilkinson and the Conservative R.A. Butler, the matter was settled. But no, the blueprint was never fully implemented, the technical schools never took off, and the system never did win universal support. The first attacks came from dissenting left-wing voices like Max Morris. He became a teacher in the 30s and was campaigning for a common school even then. We had to defeat the idea, which was then prevalent in the Labour Party, that the way to working class advancement was through entry into the grammar schools. Build more grammar schools. Instead of 20%, have 25%. But what about the other 75%? You had to have a common school which was entirely unselective. You removed the division that way. You might think these early campaigners attacking the grammar schools had to wait several decades for results, that comprehensives didn't appear until the 60s. In fact, they appeared much earlier. Not the 60s, but in the 40s. Was this a product of egalitarian politics, of a comprehensive ideal? Maybe a little but it was also down to the practicalities of structuring schools in sparsely populated areas. So the first proper comprehensive in England and Wales began life in 1949, and it was a long way from the big cities. Perhaps symbolically, the first comprehensively comprehensive local authority was on an island, and there, Ken Roberts was one of Britain's very first comprehensive school pupils. We're actually standing just within the gateway of what used to be the county grammar school. Uh, there's a road, and on the other side is the red brick St. Cubby's School, which was then the secondary modern school, opposite to the county grammar school. And this made it convenient for the physical combination of the two when everything became comprehensive. Anglesey was interested in introducing comprehensive education at this time. David Crook, a historian at the Institute of Education at the University of London. It was given encouragement by a 1945 Ministry of Education pamphlet that had specifically said that comprehensive experiments might be appropriate in rural areas. And the idea of a judicious experiment in Anglesey served the twin purpose, I think, of getting over the 11 plus objection. And at the same time, it was a very cost effective means of offering secondary education on the island. And so in 1949, for solid practical reasons, Anglesey began merging a grammar and a secondary modern into Holyhead County School, recognised as the first school in England and Wales to have a full comprehensive intake. You were such a figure that we, we were like mice going along the corridors. Gladys Pritchard, one of that first generation of comprehensive pupils, remembers the head of Holyhead, Trevor Lovett, a formidable early pioneer of the comprehensive system. He recognised that whatever the practical arguments for a comprehensive, there was an ideal here too. It was in the school magazine. There was a letter from the head... Master, Mr. Lovett, the letter said, Dear girls and boys, your school is about to enter on a very important and interesting experiment. As you will be called upon to take a leading part in this experiment, I think it only right that you should know something about it. Initial steps for the fusion of your school with the former St. Cubby Modern Secondary School have been taken. The head, Trevor Lovett, was an amazing dynamic man. One of the early pupils at Holyhead was Glenys Kinnock. He didn't just encourage the bright kids, he, he always tried to nurture others, and he knew everybody's name. He was a great guy. 
One of the principles that Mr. Lovett uh, stressed was the removal of the invidious system of the LM+. Plus. I had a close friend with me in primary school. He unfortunately failed and later on in life he, it was pretty obvious that he was grammar school material. When this combination took place, my friend appeared on our side, and uh, I was absolutely delighted. We shall be a very large family, perhaps more than 950 pupils, with a staff of 44 teachers. In my opinion, the fusion will result in increased benefits for all. We were aware that something big was going on because Mr. Lovett used to disappear from time to time. Of course, he was lecturing around the country on the subject. We frequently received visitors. Very often, by their appearance, the visitors were from strange places and very often didn't speak our language, but they stood watching everything. They would come around the school, looking at us in our classrooms, looking in the laboratories, and it did make you feel very important to think these people had come here from far, far away to look at us. Patricia Roberts, another of the first pupils. Trevor Lovett himself was an old grammar school head and built this first comprehensive on the grammar ethos. Gowns for teachers and cap inspections for pupils. But it was still a comp and it was still hard for some to come to terms with. The sad children in the first year who had earned a place at grammar school to find no grammar there. Ken Roberts. They had gone through the same routine that we had, looking forward to attending this prestigious county grammar school, buying of uh, equipment and a brand new uniform, turning up on that first day at the county school and then being ordered to go to the other side, to the secondary modern side. It was a down moment for those poor pupils. The first Latin teacher I had, we called Mrs. Mop because she had this huge mop of black hair. But uh, she had no discipline because she'd been used to working in, in, in grammar streams. And when she tried to teach Latin to the likes of me and some of the people that I was hanging out with, she did find it rather difficult, I have to say. But I did end up as head girl of the school, which was a huge surprise to everybody, including my parents. But that was because Trevor Lovett thought that I had done so well in my O-levels and was likely to go to university uh, uh, that he was really proud of that. He said that you are a product of what this is all about. If all teachers and pupils have the good of their school at heart and working together and playing together, learn to serve God and one another, then I have little doubt that the experiment will be a great educational and social success. With best wishes, T. Levitt, Headmaster. An island at the edge of the country is one thing, but what about the big cities? Well, even before the ink was dry on the tripartite system, another pioneer of the comprehensive emerged in London, as David Crook explains. In 1925, the young Board of Education inspector called Graham Savage visited the United States to see American high schools. These were non-selective and an idea was sown in his mind and he returned to London enthusiastic about the idea of non-selective education. In 1940, Savage is appointed as education officer to the London County Council and there he encounters all kinds of enthusiasts for comprehensive education. We thought it was more egalitarian in America than we had. They had the sharply divided system. London teacher and comprehensive campaigner Max Morris. Savage was a very important element because the LCC was a pioneering area and Savage began introducing individual comprehensive schools. In 1947, Savage unveiled the London Schools Plan, which was a really radical proposal to develop 63 comprehensive schools across London. Children of all kinds will attend the same school, the plan said. The immediate aim is the provision of many-sided education in an atmosphere of social unity. And Savage set about putting that into Some practice. Is behind the new Kidbrook School built by the LCC in East London. More than 1,500 girls can be seated in the vast assembly hall. Kidbrook, which caters only for... Kidbrook School near Greenwich was the first brand new comp 
built for London. It opened with 1,600 pupils, a huge and a very expensive flagship for the new comp idea. It enjoyed fame back then, and indeed again this year, featuring in Jamie Oliver's school dinners programme on Channel 4. And this summer, Kidbrook marked its 50th birthday, where I met some of the pupils who had passed through the school gates on its very first day back in September 1954, including Joyce Roke. I lived fairly close at the time, and I, I can remember walking with my father around the big block, seeing it built, brick by brick. We're in the hall here. Now, it must have seemed awfully big at the time, I'm guessing. It was absolutely enormous. I had never been in anything quite this large. There was inevitable media attention for a school so radical, it even had science labs for girls. Joyce took me up to the headmistress's office to show me some press cuttings from the time. We've got here the News Chronicle of the 29th of June, 54, the first palace of learning. The new Wonder School has everything except radar, and it did have everything. It had the gymnasium, it had the orchestras, the choirs. You do get a real sense of awe, don't you, about this new place, as though this was a sort of new world oh, we're going yes. into. Because it doesn't yes. look that exceptional when you're here now, does it? I mean, it no, looks fairly normal. No, it does normal, but you go back 50 years, and, and this was quite exceptional. Among other students who were there on the first day were Pat Strong, Susan Goldstein and Carol Haywood. I was just bowled over. The school was so beautiful and light and airy. Every staircase was a huge block of really bold colour. What about the teachers? What were the teachers like? The teachers that taught me, I think, all came from grammar schools. Mm. And so they must have been interested in trying something new. I don't think it was that they were out of a job, most of them. They were taking a big risk, weren't they, mm -hmm. to actually uh, give that up, to start something brand new like yes. this that could have been an absolute total failure. It was a comprehensive school. Was that word used at the time? Were you yes. aware and calling it, it Kibra Comp? It Is was, that... absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And absolutely. did you say yes. Comp or Comprehensive? Comprehensive. comprehensive. In the Daily Mail, in 15th of September, 54, Britain's most luxurious and most controversial school. People were wondering, is this big school going to work? My mother always felt that the people that were against it were really snobby. And my mother had a friend whom I always detested. And she thought it was a terrible thing that I was coming here and not going to a proper grammar school mm. when I had passed the exam, you know. Mm. But my mother's philosophy was, well, you're going to have to meet all kinds of people out in the world, so why not start now? As it happens, Savage's nice idea of everyone going to the same school did hit snags. One sceptic said of it, all equal and all stupid. And a local grammar school that was meant to merge into Kidbrook successfully campaigned to save itself. A sign of battles to come. And even the education at Kidbrook didn't suit everybody. Pat Goddard had been at a central school, a kind of grammar school light, that was absorbed into Kidbrook. If we'd stayed at the central school, we could have taken up to eight O levels. When we came here, we could only take three. If we wanted to take more, we had to take, stay on till the sixth year. Well, our parents couldn't afford that. I'd always wanted to be a librarian, but I needed five O levels, so there was no way I could do it when I left school. It wasn't academic enough. How did your education, particularly here, affect your decisions about your own children's education? When my son changed school, it was the year that they were deciding to change the system in the area, so I went out to work to pay for him to go to a private school because I didn't want him to be an experiment. I just thought that that many years down the line, they should have sorted it out by then. There is one of our friends here today who actually works in a comprehensive school now, and I think she's a perfect example of what the comprehensive education system is about. Mm -hmm. She came in at virtually the bottom stream, and within a year she came up to mine, which was the third out of 15 or so. And that's what it's all about, really. She would have been sent to a secondary modern school mm -hmm. otherwise. If three men take two hours to dig a garden, how long should one man take? The pioneer comprehensives in London and a handful of other places such as Coventry and the Tory-governed West Riding of Yorkshire showed you could perfectly well teach all types of children in one school without inciting riots. But in most parts of the country, the debate over education was less concerned with the performance of the handful of comprehensives and more with resentment at the 11 plus. By spending an extra three shillings and sixpence, a man bought three chickens instead of two ducks. The ducks would have cost him twelve shillings and threepence. What was the price of a chicken? 
The exam had been intended as a liberator of working-class talent, a modern scientific way to cut through privilege. But was it working? In the 1950s, A. H. Halsey was a rising young sociologist. Analysis of the 11-plus results pretty much showed that about a quarter of the children were misallocated by the 11-plus procedure. There was a kind of untapped pool of ability in working-class children, which didn't show the light of day, even when those tests were applied. The underlying major proposition was. If we want to have economic growth, we had to use this latent ability that was there in the working class and which was unused, wasted, by the present system. Those children who come from good homes with good educational backgrounds stand a better chance of getting selection for grammar or technical schools than those who come from bad homes or bad educational backgrounds. Gathering discontent with the 11 plus from teachers talking on TV to left-wing sociologists, and they had some surprising allies. It wasn't only a left-wing criticism; it was also, crucially, backed by some middle-class families who had their own children rejected by the 11 plus procedure. By the 1950s, parents had developed greater aspirations for their children, and increasingly they were dissatisfied by the kind of education offered in the secondary modern school. It was very rare in secondary modern schools for children to be able to take public examinations at 16. Well, now, Janet, you've come to the secondary school, secondary modern school. You know that that is what it is called, don't you? Yes, we were rather sorry Janet failed the 11 plus. Well, I. I hardly think that failed is the right word, Mrs. Kitchen. She would have failed the test had she been selected for the wrong school, and therefore, if she's been selected for the right school, then she's really passed the test. Alas, parents didn't always see it that way. The fundamental problem with the grammar system, never satisfactorily resolved by its proponents, is that while aspiring parents were happy to have their child selected into a grammar school. Few were happy to have their child selected for a secondary modern, yet that was the fate awaiting three quarters of the population. Some of those running the system were also getting disillusioned. Andrew Fairburn was a local authority education officer. No one disputed the 11 plus until the number of people who were missing out very, very badly by one mark, with some pretty terrible horror stories coming along. Made us think that the time was ripe for change. Horror stories: the father who refused to speak to his daughter for three months because she failed the eleven plus by one mark. One child went out on the moors and killed herself. Andrew Fairburn settled in Leicestershire. His boss there was Stuart Mason, who had been feeling the pressure of parental resentment, as his biographer Don Jones recounts. Parents would write to him and say, "You've caused my child a tremendous amount of sadness and upset, and believe me, Mr. Mason, you will pay for this in the end." And so Mason became disillusioned about the 11 plus exam, and therefore began to think what he could do. Well, my daughter in the middle fifties, getting ready to go to the secondary school, and the Mason plan come along, which, in my opinion. Is the finest thing that ever happened to education in Leicestershire, because when the eleven plus was being taken, if you failed that, your education was more or less finished. So the next important milestone in the story of comprehensives was Stuart Mason's 1957 plan for reorganising schools in Leicestershire. The county was not socialist; it was conservative dominated. As comprehensives were still a new frontier at the time, there was no fixed model for reforming the grammar system. You didn't have to build a Kidbrook or a Hollyhead. Instead, Mason took the old system that divided children by ability and divided them by age. He turned secondary moderns into comprehensive high schools for 11 to 14 year olds. The grammars became upper schools for 14 to 18 year olds. This ingeniously avoided having to build new schools or having to bus children between different sites in one school. Even more brilliantly, Mason let the grammar upper schools keep the name grammar. One can only wonder how different attitudes towards comps might have been if we'd done that nationally. There was nonetheless some resistance from grammar teachers, as Betty Main remembers. She was a parent and a primary teacher at the time. 
we went to a meeting at the then grammar school when all was revealed. I can still remember that evening, and it was a very, very tight meeting. There were a few gasps from the audience, and some of the grammar school staff were not at all in favour of it, whereas we in the primary schools were thrilled to death. The atmosphere was tremendous. I'll never forget it. Tom Kelly was one of the first pupils to go through the Mason plan. The boys who were in the bottom two classes in terms of academic ability had a completely different curriculum from the rest of us. For example, they used to run an allotment across the road from the school, but they were also set to very menial tasks like cleaning up the playgrounds when the rest of us were studying. And looking back on it, I mean, it just makes one cringe. These prototypical comprehensives were perhaps unrecognisable from comps today, in culture evidently, and in structure. But by 1960, the comprehensive had momentum. The post-war system had diminished. Gone was the grand tripartite vision. What was left was a crude system for rationing places at the good grammar schools. The 11 plus seemed less a ticket to opportunity, more a barrier to personal ambition and national economic development. With power passing from one generation to another, education passed from one vision to another. The old guard of the left, who had seen the grammar as working class liberation, had to cope with a change in thinking. In the early 60s, Chris Price was a young Labour councillor in Sheffield. He remembers the decisive meeting with the head of Sheffield's Education Committee, a senior Labour traditionalist called Albert Ballard. The local boys grammar school, King Edwards, was an ordinary local authority school. And Albert Ballard fought for that and was terribly, terribly proud of the fact, lived his whole life feeling, I kept a grammar school for Sheffield. And so it was a terrible shock to him to feel we had to go comprehensive. He'd been under pressure, I think, from other people saying, let's make most schools comprehensive, but not two of them. And I said to Albert, look, th that's like being a little bit pregnant. If you go comprehensive, you go comprehensive. That's the whole point. And he said, yeah, I know, but couldn't we just save King Edwards? And I said, no, Albert, it doesn't work that way. You either do nothing or the lot. And he said, yeah, I thought you'd say that. So can I go and have a little cry? And he did. He went into the next room and wept and then came back and said, I'm better now. Right, we can go comprehensive. By 1960, there were just 130 comprehensives in England and Wales, still educating fewer than 5% of state sector students. But the 60s was to be the decade for radical change. Advocates of the comprehensive were heading for power. In the next programme, we look at the systematic attempt to turn all of England and Wales comprehensive. Could that really occur without a fight? Comp was presented by Evan Davis and produced by Phil Tinline. And you can hear the programme again this evening at half past nine. And Comp continues at nine o'clock next Thursday morning. Now this morning's Olympic story, which we first broadcast last year. In 1992, Britain's relay team took bronze in the men's 4 by 400 metres. One of the athletes on the podium in Barcelona to collect his medal was just a teenager. He appeared to have the world at his feet. Yet within two years, his sporting career was over. Diane Madal meets David Grindley and discovers how injury shattered his Olympic dream. It's a small one as well. Yeah. So when was the last time you would have been through this box? Because I can sort of detect a faint tinge of, of musk or whatever you yeah. would call it. Look, it's, it hasn't been open for a while, has no, it? No, not for box? a long time. My mother put it all the way for me, really. She's just... Uh, Kept it in good nick, yeah. in good shape. Tracks it bottoms. Oh, oh you're excellent. A, your accreditation, <laughs> your pass to get Good you God. in and out of the Olympic Village and into the. Yeah, I'd say I'd fair then as well. <laughs> and a Morrissey haircut. Gosh. Yeah, I do look quite young on that, actually. That's your passport. Yeah. And you've still got your key on there, your door key. Yeah, I wonder if it still fits somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> they were wandering the Olympic Village again. Yeah. Somebody owns that apartment. Let yourself now. in. In fact, these are my shoes. At last I found them. Are these the very spikes yeah, you raced in? Yeah, these are the spikes I brought the British record in. 
I'm running the final oh in, actually. Goodness me. What have you written on them at the side there? The Olympic Games UK record, 44.47. Wow. What are you thinking now, looking at these? <laughs> I can't believe I ran in such skimpy shoes. <laughs> just looking at this now, I just think, no wonder I ended up with problems mm -hmm. with uh, running his bikes like this. But, <clears> like <throat> you say, we they did the business, propelled me to a British record, and I got sixth place in a final. Right. That's yeah. coming fine. David can now look back on what he's achieved with great pride, but it's been a difficult 12 years since he was a cool, calm teenager hitting the world stage in Barcelona. In fact, he was so cool, he nearly missed his flight to Spain. I was only 19 at the time, so then... You sort of, like, take things in your stride, I think, at those stage. If, if it happened to me now, today, I'd be absolutely over-the-moon ecstatic. But I think you look at it a little bit nonchalant you, when, you, when you're that kind of age. I mean, when I was actually uh, due to fly out to the Olympics themselves, I was at the track chatting with my friends, and it just typifies the way I looked on things at the time. Is that My mother rang me up and said, do you realise your flight is in an hour and a half's time and I've got to get to Manchester Airport? <laughs> And I'm like, oh, and I, I threw things in a suitcase and, and off I went. And that's, I mean, my dad still looks back on that and just, he just can't believe it. It was perfect in a way because from the warm up area, you walked from the 100 metre start finish line down the home straight and then you prepared yourself for the run. And it was sort of like walking into a, a cauldron, really, because there was a lot of British supporters there, which was good. And you felt as though you were walking into one big fight, in a way, sort of thing. It was that kind of situation in Barcelona. It's sort of like a steamy heat in that cauldron. I, it was... I, I've never come across a situation like it in my life. Just that particular evening, it was just amazing. Did you feel overawed at any time? Did you think, oh my gosh, I just cannot do this? Yeah. It crossed my mind quite a few times. And like I say, you're always going to fight against whether you're going to crumble or whether you're going to perform. And um, and I was just really lucky that I actually came up with the goods. The fact that I ran 44.4 seconds and broke the British record, it was actually, I was completely gobsmacked. I hadn't a clue where it had come from. I wasn't expecting it. I was just going to run my very best and try and make the final. The Olympic 400 metres men's final here in Barcelona is yeah, about cool. to go. And away they go. And Lewis has got... As I said, when I got into that final itself uh, two days later, because I was only a young man, I was only a teenager, I didn't really have the strength behind me to run four decent races in a row within five days, which is effectively what you've got to do. So in a way, a little bit disappointing, but looking back on it as a teenager, I couldn't have asked for any better. Roberto Hernandez, but here comes David Grindley. He's running the race of his life, but it's going to be gold for the United States. Gold for Quincy Watts. He crosses the line now. He's broken the Olympic record again. But the teenager had to raise his game again, as, despite tough competition, he was selected for the GB relay team. I was really lucky that I got the relay place because there were so many people vying for those places. Well, the 4 by 400 metres final is about to get away. The last big track final at yes, the Barcelona Olympics. Just the marathon to come after this. And away they go, and Roger Black in lane two instantly explodes out of the blocks. Well, the Olympic 4x4 four four final in 92 was another chance for Great Britain to win a medal. It was myself on the first leg, to David, to I think Chris Akabusi and John Regis. It was a good team. The Cubans are starting to tie up. Regis makes his challenge, but he can't get there. It's gold for the United States. It's silver for Cuba. It's bronze for John Regis and for Britain. And that was a world... And to actually get that bronze medal, it's just... Well, it takes pride of place in, in my parents' house. I look back on it with really, really fond memories. It's something that I've achieved in my life and something that I'll always think about. It was a funny moment, really, because on, on the rostrum, David, I think, was, was delighted to have an Olympic medal. But myself, John and Chris had been world champions the year before. And I think for us, it was, it, there was quite a lot of disappointment with the fact that we'd only won a bronze medal. And, and, and more importantly, on the greatest stage of them all, the Olympic stage, we'd underperformed. For David, you know, he'd had a fabulous Olympic Games. He got to the Olympic final. He was 19 years old. He had his whole athletic career ahead of him because if he can do that at 19, he would have been thinking, wow, next year I'm going to run faster. The year after that, bam, 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 bang. Gosh, I'm going to be the Olympic champion one day. 
So at the closing ceremony then, when the Olympic flag is coming down and then they start looking forward and talking about the next Olympic Games will be in Atlanta 1996, you must have been really excited and eager for that to happen quickly. Obviously, I had, had the, uh, my whole career ahead of me. I was 19. I was the British record holder. I felt I had such potential behind me. And I thought, in four years' time, what, I'm going to be 23 years old in 1996. I thought, well, you know, the world's my oyster. I came back and won the World Grand Prix final at the end of that season. The British record holder, David Grindley, leads now from Nuti of Italy. He goes forward now, crosses the line, 44.76. My word, that is some run. David Grindley goes underneath the 45-second barrier. As soon as I finished that, I felt a small niggle in Achilles' tendon. And, I mean, lots of athletes know that Achilles' tendon problems are the biggest nightmare of an athlete. And from then on, I just struggled with injury from basically a month after the end of that season, 1993. He would have won major medals individually on the World and Olympic stage. He would have done that. Um, we'll never know how fast he could have run, but he was, he was seriously good. Roger Black's own career was hit by illness. He suffered glandular fever in 93. But all athletes can expect to pick up injuries or illness. One might naively expect world-class athletes would get world-class medical help from the federations which groomed them for stardom. The reality before lottery funding, however, was quite different. As far as uh, the British Athletics Federation at the time giving me any backup, whereas in the past when I was younger I had lots of people helping me along the way, I felt that I was just left to my own devices. I received one or two phone calls over a year period possibly in 1994, where you'd, you'd think if I was ranked second in the world, if any sports person was ranked second in the world, then the, the Federation would give them some backup and some support and find out what, what was actually happening. But I felt really, really disappointed that they've just been left to me on devices and just to get on with it. And I know, I know it's an individual sport, it's not, it's not a team sport we're talking about, but so at the end of the day, an athletics federation is there to deal with the athletes and then to help the athletes progress, because it's obviously there to progress the sport, isn't it? And I felt that that wasn't, that wasn't happening at the time. Understandably, David feels aggrieved at how he had to fend for himself during this difficult time. I suffered the same sense of isolation and frustration of injury during my career. And David Moorcroft, head of UK Athletics, says that sense of loneliness was far from unique. I first competed for Great Britain in 1973 and I can count on one hand the number of phone calls I had from the governing body for the next... 15, 20 years. I mean, that was very much part of the scene then, is that you, you know, if you did well enough, you did it probably despite the system rather than because of the system, but if you did well enough, you get picked and off you go to a championship. And if you won a medal, everyone would think you were great. If you had a bad year, people would forget you. Hopefully that isn't the case now, that athletes like David, with the talent that they've got, because of lottery support and because of improved medical support and because people now have got the time to be caring, that things have improved. But I'm sure even going forward in the future, there'll be young David Grinleys who come on the scene who will be exceptionally good. And with the best will in the world and with the best resources available, they'll still break down. And it's a real shame. It does show you that, um, you know, for every great Olympic glory story, and the post-Olympic story is often one of tragedy or, or incredible disappointment. And that's the way it's been for David. And perhaps the fate of an athlete in the first of the Barcelona semi-finals should have served as a warning to David. It was Derek Redmond's record which Grindley broke in the other semi-final. Down the back straight, but Redmond pulls up. The tendon's gone. Redmond is out. His games are over. Well, I'm almost moved to tears here because we've seen Derek Redmond run so well the last two days. And he's got up and courageously he's hopping round the remaining 300 metres of the track. To the Derek's Olympic the career ended very publicly. But although as athletes we understand that our careers must come to an end at some point, nothing can prepare you for a life outside the arena. I don't think you can ever fill the void of athletics, really. The competition that you experience and that level of competition, that intensity, that's something that I'll always miss, actually, because... There's nothing in life now that actually compares to that. Actually coming off the final bend with a, an appreciative crowd, maybe 30,000 crowd just screaming you and willing you on, like 
like an example would be the Grand Prix final at Crystal Palace that it won. Grindley leads by six or seven metres. This is good running from the British 400 metre man. The British record holder, David Grindley. Nothing in life, as I said, compares to that. But I've I've got a new interest in life. Uh, it's my career. Um, I'm now into aviation. I'm actually a professional pilot. If I'm flying a 767-300 version, it's 186 tonnes of aircraft, which is just it's a really, really fantastic feeling if you're hand flying the thing, you know, you're flying it manually. Like yesterday, for instance, we flew into, into Luxor in Egypt, and we were flying, you know, over the Valley of the Kings, coming along in, down into Nile Valley, and we just sort of made a left turn, I was hand flying it, and it was just such a wonderful feeling, and then to land it in the middle of the desert, really, it was just a really, really Excellent feeling. Injuries may have limited Davy's experience to just the one Olympic Games, but I know he'll be watching Athens, looking at the times and thinking, I could have made that final. And he's relished the chance to relive his own Olympic glory, illicitly returning to Barcelona's Olympic Stadium. Yeah, that was really, really nice. In fact, that was a really moving moment. I went with a friend of mine, uh, a captain from work, very good friend. We we sort of broke in, we were wandering around. <laughs> and uh, we shouldn't have done it, because there is actually a spectators area where people can walk in and it's a bit of a touristy mm. uh, type of venue. But we clambered over this fence and walked where we shouldn't have gone and then we ended up getting onto the track. Got told off, off afterwards. We walked around the track and I just talked. Talked to him about how I felt when we were on the way around. Really? In fact, I ran in lane five where I broke the British record. So I walked in lane five where I broke the British record. And for the last 100 metres, I walked along in lane three where I ran in the Olympic final. So that was, mm. it was really moving because just to see the stadium again, it's different again when there's no people in it. Mm. But it was just a really nice feeling just to walk along there and have all the memories. Olympic Stories was produced by Rebecca Sandals and it was an all-out production for BBC Radio 4. Well, in a moment on FM, we continue the tales from the country matchmaker. First, Rick Stein, who was last year's BBC Food Personality of the Year, has details of how you can nominate someone for this year's awards. I was delighted to be voted Food Personality of the Year last time. But these awards are mainly for those people often unrecognised who work tirelessly to promote and protect the best of British food. And we want to celebrate them with your help, whether it's a great school cook, an inspirational farmer, or a shopkeeper who makes a special effort. We want to know. You'll find an entry form on the website bbc.co.uk slash foodawards, or you can email your suggestions to foodawards at bbc.co.uk, or you might prefer to call 0870 333 4373 for more information. And those details again. The entry forms can be found on bbc.co.uk slash foodawards, that's all one word, or you can call 0870 333 4373 for more information. And you have until the 16th of September to make 